Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Great to see you guys here this morning. And if you would, please go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 21. We're going to be studying verses 1 through 17 today. And I've got some good news or bad news, depending on the individual here. And I will let you decide whether it's good news or bad news, okay? Uh, last week, I told you that today would be the last sermon in the Gospel of John. We actually have this Sunday and then next Sunday will be the last sermon in the Gospel of John. And that's either good news or bad news, depending on how well you're loving this series. Uh, but here's the deal. I was diving into John chapter 21, and it was just foolish to even suppose or imagine that we were going to finish this in one Sunday. And so rather than have, you know, an hour and a half sermon, all right, uh, we're going to cut that down to two shorter sermons. So that may be the good news or the, the uh, silver lining to the cloud this morning. But glad you're here this morning. We have a lot to read, a lot to study, and a lot to apply Let's jump in. Are you there? John 21, starting in verses 1 through 14 is where we're going to start. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. By the way, that's also known as the Sea of Galilee. Okay? And Jesus manifested himself in this way. Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going to go fishing. And they said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Verse 4. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. So they cast, and they were then not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Verse 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, by the way, who is that? Who have we learned that that is always referring to? John, right? The guy who's writing the gospel. It's referring to John. Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, Look, it's Jesus! So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about a hundred yards or so away, dragging the net full of fish. So when they got out on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing full well that it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and the fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. I want to pause right there and just kind of briefly talk about these verses. Um, this is the second miraculous catch of fish that the disciples had. If you remember early on in Jesus' ministry as he was calling the disciples to him, the same scene practically uh, identical unfolds. They were out fishing. Jesus is like, hey, you guys have any luck? No, we didn't have any luck. Well, why don't we try casting on the other side? Only that time, if you remember, the disciples were already in from fishing. They were cleaning their nets. Jesus is like, hey, why don't you guys go back on out and try to catch some more fish? And they were like, are you crazy? Uh, two things about this entire scene that kind of I want to point out to your attention. Why in the world didn't this spark up some sort of nostalgia with the disciples? Why didn't they instantly be like, oh, man, there's a guy who's telling us to go cast our nets again, and we're going to catch fish? Well, here's why. It's been three years since that first great catch of fish. And so it's been a minute or two, all right? Maybe it slipped their minds. Maybe they had their mind on other things. Uh, second thing I wanted to point out to you is this. What a disgusting breakfast this is. Did any of you have fish this morning for breakfast? I'm guessing not, right? And I like fish, but it seems like there's a time and a place. But here, Jesus is providing this, this breakfast, which would have been very traditional for them at that time, and to go along with it, bread, to go along with that as well. Um, something else that I think is, is worth noting is the number of fish, 153. 
And yeah, they're going to count. A real fisherman is going to count how many they caught. And uh, that is exactly what happened. But don't miss it. This is definitely a miraculous catch of fish. And it's remarkable. Uh, something else that also just, you know, uh, brings to my mind is how terrible of fishermen are these guys? Do they ever catch anything without the help of Jesus? You know, I mean, this is now the third time where they've been fishing. The second time I can remember was when, uh, you know, they had to pay the temple tax. and They didn't have anything. And she's like, go, go fishing. And Peter goes fishing and catches a fish and it has money in its mouth for him and for Jesus. Um, do they catch anything without the help of Jesus? And furthermore, how bad a fisherman are they that they're taking advice from a stranger on the beach? You know, if I was a carpenter, and some old guy was walking his dog on the sidewalk, and he says, I think you're need to... Would I be listening to him about how to do a roof? You know? Uh, I, I would if it was Mark Nichols doing the work. But it just makes me think how, how these men were actually not doing what they've been called to do or what they were created to do, even. We'll get to that in just a minute. But here again is the third appearance that Jesus makes to his disciples after resurrecting from the dead. And so far throughout all of his resurrection appearances, Jesus has been very kind. He's been very patient. And here he's been very generous. First with Mary Magdalene, as Jesus provided hope to her discouragement. You remember that when we first looked at that early on in John chapter 20. This woman was very distraught, discouraged, downhearted. And Jesus provided help and hope to her in her time of discouragement by presenting himself as alive. And then the second sermon in this whole resurrection appearance series happened in the upper room where the disciples were gathered behind closed and locked door for fear of the Jews. And there, Jesus brings peace and a comfort and a calmness to their fear. And then last week for Easter, we looked at how tender, how compassionate Jesus approaches doubting Thomas who has some questions who has some doubts who says I'm not going to believe unless and Jesus approaches Thomas and presents himself as alive and says look you can touch him I'm here well even now as we begin to open up John chapter 21 we see Jesus being so tender as he appears to them on the beach and prepares a fish breakfast for them but now as we enter into our main part of the text this morning, verses 15 through 17, something's going to change. We're going to see a confrontation take place. And this is where I want to focus our attention this morning. Start being in verse 15, follow along. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my lambs. Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things, and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Have you ever heard of the military strategy called divide and conquer? This was a strategy that was first made popular by Julius Caesar. Uh, this strategy was also implemented by Adolf Hitler in World War II. The idea of divide and conquer is if you have a formidable foe that's coming against you that seems too big to defeat all in one fell swoop, well, your goal is to divide this big army into smaller sections so that you can conquer those smaller sections more efficiently, more effectively. But long before it was a military strategy, it was a spiritual strategy used by Satan. If you're taking notes, make a note of this. In all places where God is trying to build and to bless, on the other side of that is Satan where he's trying to divide and conquer. I want you to weigh your mind upon that just for a second. Chew on that just for a second. In all places where God is trying to build and to bless, 
you have Satan who's trying to divide, who's trying to separate, and who's trying to defeat and conquer. Think about where it is God is trying to bless. Where is it that God wants to try to bless us? For some, it's in the business world. And God is trying to bless your business. He's trying to help you in, in your work and, and be with you in your work. But here's the problem. As men and women focus to build their careers, Satan is coming in. He's trying to divide your heart away from God and focus on money and focus on promotions and focus on uh, position. And, and Satan is trying to divide a wedge between what it is God has told us true success is. For others, it's families, where Satan is trying to create a divide and a wedge between a husband and a wife, between a mom and a dad and their children. He's trying to separate them. He's trying to cause conflict. We see it in our country. This country is more divided now than it ever has been in my lifetime. And I'm not that old yet, right? Someone say amen. <laughs> Matthew chapter 12, verse 25 says this, A house divided against itself cannot stand. Jesus said this truth when he was being accused by the religious leaders of being possessed by a demon. But it's a principle and it's, and it's a truth that holds true in so many different areas that something that is divided cannot possibly stand. And Satan knows this. And that's why he's trying to divide your heart from your family, from your country, from your church family. The subject this morning is divided loyalty. Where something becomes more important than Jesus Christ. And it could be anything. It could be something that's sinful, and certainly there are things that divide us from God because of our sinful choosing, drugs, alcohol, sexual promiscuity. Uh, those things could be something where we have divided loyalty. But more often than not, it's not something that's inherently sinful by itself. It might be a hobby. It might be your job. It might be money. And those things by themselves are not a bad thing. They're only bad when they take the place of Jesus Christ, when they have higher priority than Jesus Christ. The title of this morning's sermon is Jesus Brings Strength to the Divided Heart, Part 1. Think about this just for a moment. I thought about it this last week. Throughout books that have been written and throughout movies that have been produced, uh, the duplicity of man's heart has been well documented and detailed. Can you think about a movie or a book that's been written where it detailed the duplicity of the man's heart? Conflict of man versus himself, if you will. Two instances I immediately thought of because I have the mind of a 14-year-old. Uh, the first one was Batman. The comic book, the movies, there was this supervillain known as Two-Face, whose name was Harvey Dent, who was involved in a terrible accident that transformed him into this anti-hero, who, because uh, of his struggle with himself, had a divided heart between being a good man for the people and an adversary of Batman. I think about J.R. Tolkien's work known as Lord of the Rings where we're introduced to Gollum. Gollum was once a gentle, peaceful hobbit known as Smeagol, who because of his love for the magical ring of power that he called my precious, right? Because of his love for this ring, it transformed him into this loathsome scoundrel. And there was this constant struggle for Smeagol as he was constantly torn between being a good person caring about his fellow hobbit and being a guy who was consumed and controlled by his lust and love for the ring. But more than just being in movies or books, the divided heart, the duplicity of man is well noted in Scripture. The source of a divided heart comes when we have two loves. Well, let's start here this morning. Competing loves are a, com are a common problem. 
Do you have a competing love in your life? Something that's distracting your affections and your attentions away from Jesus Christ? Now we're going to circle back around and we're going to focus on verses 15 through 17. But before we dive into those verses and study them significantly, I want you to remember the last recorded conversation that Simon Peter and Jesus Christ had. It was in the upper room on the night that Jesus was to be betrayed and the night before He was to be crucified. And do you remember the conversation? Jesus had just finished telling His disciples, I'm going away and you cannot follow Me now, but eventually you'll be where I am. And Peter interjects and he says, well, why can't I follow You, Lord? I will lay down My life for You. And Jesus looks at Peter and says, You will? Really? Before the rooster crows three times, you will deny me. And the last thing that Simon Peter wanted to do was to fail the Lord. And since he's been brought back to life, he's been resurrected back to life, Jesus has been coming and going and appearing to different people, and there's never really been an opportunity for Jesus to have a conversation with Peter until now. And Peter always automatically assumed that Jesus was his first and only love in his life, but he soon discovered that he had other things that seemed to matter more than Jesus did. But before we get too hard on Peter, uh, let me ask you this question. What's on your list? What are some things that compete with Christ in your life? As I said, the enemy's strategy, Satan's strategy, is to divide, to divide your heart and then conquer your heart. What's the thing that Satan would use to dangle out in front of you to try to get you to chase after it rather than chasing after God? For some here this morning, maybe it's your reputation, your family's reputation in the community. I care what people think about me. I, I care what people say about me more than I care about what people, or, or more than I care about what my relationship looks like with the Lord. Maybe that's what you're consumed with, my reputation. For others, maybe it's your family. Now listen, we love family. Do you love your family? I hope you love your family. But here's a really, really important question that I really want you to evaluate this morning. Do you worship your family? Because on the surface, all of us would be like, no, I don't worship my family. Do you worship your family? One of the observations I've made in our society today, one of the things that I've seen so prevalent today, and it's easy for me to point fingers, right? Because I don't have any children of my own. But one of the things that I have simply noticed in our society today is parents elevating their children to a godlike status. Where we would do anything for my kids. And I want my kids to be happy. And I want them to have what I didn't have. And while they would not say that they are not worshiping their kids, one has to wonder. In case you're wondering, putting or elevating your kids above God is never a good idea. Ask Abraham how that went. You remember Abraham, don't you? He and his wife Sarah had this one and only son named Isaac whom they loved dearly. And God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac to him on the altar. Do you remember that? Why? Because Abraham was in danger of elevating Isaac ahead of God and God was trying to see who do you love more? Me or your kids? Now thankfully, God is a gracious God. And He intervened and provided a ram. But I think the point was proven to Abraham. God's like, I'm first in your life. And if your kids take first place in the, your life, listen, you're not loving them well. You'll love them better if they are not first in your life. By the way, can I also just push the observation a little bit further, if I may? Might I suggest to you today that I think one of the reasons that divorce rates are at an all-time high is because mom and dad, husband and wife, have taken the focus off of each other and we've placed it on the kids. 
Is that the focus of a marriage relationship? Listen, in the order of things, in the order of loves in your life, did you know that God has an order? It's God first, husband and wife second, children third. Did you know that? You're like, where'd you get that, Mark? Well, let me just point out to you and ask you this. What does Scripture say a husband would leave his mom and dad for? For his kids? I'm going to leave my husband, I'm going to leave my mom and dad to cling to my kids? Is that what Scripture says? Scripture says a man will leave his father and mother and cling to his wife. As Paul is giving the marital roles in Ephesians, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. That doesn't mean that parents are supposed to hate their kids. Not at all. But when we're focusing all of our attention on our kids and we've gotten that whole formula out of line, it's no wonder that the marriage relationship is suffering. Maybe it's not your family. Maybe it's your career. Man, I'd never be late for a meeting. Whatever my boss asks, I would do. I'm available on the weekends to answer my phone, whatever they would need, because I want the position. I want the promotion. I want the raise but I won't commit to serving God. I won't commit to working for God or volunteering for God because after all, my job takes priority. For others, maybe it's my stuff. The things that I own. The things that I want to have. And I've said this time and time again, it's not wrong to have something. It's wrong when something has you. And then finally, maybe it's none of those things except your pleasure. Can I just tell you how saddened and grieved I am by my Facebook posts when it gets time for the weekend? I have lots of Facebook friends who will post things, and you can tell that they are living for pleasure, waiting for the weekend, TGIF, time for the boat and some buds. You know, that's what they're living for. They're living for pleasure. Now here's the thing I want you to understand. Nothing on that list by itself is evil. In fact, a lot of those things God wants you to have and wants you to enjoy. He wants you to love those things. Here's the problem. The problem is when the priority and the focus becomes that and that alone. And God kind of gets leftovers. He kind of gets the scraps. God wants to be top of the pyramid. Okay? All competing loves need to bow before the throne of Jesus Christ as Lord. The throne is what is a symbol of sovereignty and control. There's only one God, one Lord. It's nothing more and nothing else other than Jesus. So returning now to our text, look at verse 15. Because Jesus is about to have a tough conversation with Peter. Now, here's what I have to ask here. Uh, well, let's just read verse 15, and then I'll ask the question. Verse 15. So when they had finished eating breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? A couple of things here. Uh, as I read that first half of verse 15, when they had finished breakfast, can you imagine the awkwardness? You know, the, uh, the air was thick enough to cut with a knife, so to speak. There was tension that was being felt. Have you ever felt that? That you knew a hard conversation was coming and you didn't know quite how to ease into it? <laughs> I love what Jesus does. He doesn't ease into it. He breaks on through to it. Breakfast is over. Hey, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He just has the conversation. And it's interesting to me. Did Jesus have this conversation with Simon Peter privately? Away from the other disciples? So as not to embarrass him? Were they all sitting around the campfire eating, kind of finishing up, and Jesus asks this question in front of everybody? I don't know. Scripture doesn't specifically tell us. I kind of believe two things happen here. I believe that Jesus is having this conversation publicly in front of the other disciples. And I think that was for Peter's benefit. Because if this conversation was never had, don't you suppose in the humanness of the other disciples, they would always hold that over uh, Simon Peter's head. Yeah, you're some big church leader. You, you denied Jesus three times on the night that he needed you the most. Don't you think that they would have always just kind of held that over his head? And so maybe Jesus is having this conversation publicly in front of the other disciples, sort of to kind of 
uh, let everybody know, look, I've dealt with it, we're moving past it. Maybe. Regardless of how or where it happened, Jesus has this conversation. And what's interesting to me is the, the name that Jesus uses for Simon Peter. He calls him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He refers to him as the name given to him by his biological parents. The name given to him before Jesus meets him and changes his name to Petros, to Peter, the rock. What's going on there? I believe Jesus is like, look, I remember where I find, found you fishermen. You're right back doing the same thing that you were doing before I called you to follow me. Has anything happened to us throughout all of these years together that even mattered to you? All that you've seen, all that I've taught you, all that you've experienced, how I change your name, does that even still stand? Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? What an interesting question posed by Jesus. Do you love me more than these? What do you suppose the these is referring to? Certainly this is a question that I believe that Jesus is, is pointing at and directing to his divided heart, his competing loves. And so Jesus says, do you love me more than these? Three possibilities of what these might be. First of all, it might be Jesus saying, do you love me more than you love these men? Peter was pretty close to the other disciples. The sons of Zebedee, James and John, were his business associates. They had probably known each other their whole lives. And they often spent time together. And Jesus hadn't been with them in recent days. And so maybe Jesus was like, what's it going to be, Peter? Is it going to be you and them? Or is it going to be you and me? You have to remember, Peter was prone to peer pressure of other people. It was in the, in the face of in the count of, of a servant girl that... Peter denied Jesus, remember? And if he could buckle to the peer pressure of a little servant girl, certainly he might buckle to the peer pressure of his friends. And so maybe Jesus is asking, do you love me more than you love your friends? Or maybe it could mean, Peter, do you love me more than these men love me? Maybe. But that doesn't seem like a question that Jesus would ask. I've never once seen God compare and try to find the best Christian. You know what I mean? It doesn't seem like that would be something that Jesus would do, would be to posture you against you or me against you. He wouldn't be like, all right, prove to me which one of you is best. That doesn't seem like something God would do. What I think this question might be referring to is, Peter, do you love me more than these nets? than these 153, 150 whatever fish that you caught? Do you love me more than this way of life? I think that's why also Jesus is calling him Simon, son of John. Do you love this way of life more than what I've called you to become? You want the life that you had before you knew me, Simon, son of John? I called you to something more. I called you to something higher. You were called to be a fisher of men. And now after all we've been through, you're back to being a fisher of fish. But how many of us can totally relate to Simon Peter? When we struggle spiritually, what's the first thing that we do? We revert back to what we know. We go back to the things that I used to do. We, we, we go back to the way that I used to behave or the way that I used to think or the people that I used to run around with. If we get hurt, if we get disappointed, if one of our prayers didn't get answered the way we wanted it, how quick we are to revert back to fishing. This is what I know. This is who I am. This is what I do. And maybe Jesus is pointing to everything that is comfortable and familiar. And for Simon Peter, he's saying, do you love me more than these fish, these nets, and the water? What a perfect but pointed question. Do you love me more than these? Because what you really need to know is that we pay a really high price for competing loves in our life. Four consequences of competing love. Here's the first one. Internal consequences. When you have a heart that's divided between two loves, 
Guess what? It robs you of all joy. It robs you of all peace. It robs you of all comfort. It robs you of all the good stuff that God wants to give you on the inside of you. It's the pain of being double-minded. And even as I'm preaching now, this is an uncomfortable sermon for you. And you don't have much peace. Why? Because you know that your heart is divided between two loves. Do you love me more than these? And sadly, the answer would have to be, no, I don't. We forfeit the joy, the peace, the harmony that Jesus would desire to bring into my life because I'm choosing other things. Here's the second consequence. They're external consequences. James chapter 1, verse 8 says that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. If you're double-minded, then you have a divided heart. If you think about things and you have two loves, you're unstable in all of your ways. Not just your relationship with the Lord, but your relationship with other people. And those relationships begin to crumble and get hurt because you're double-minded. Um, a person who has two competing loves is double-minded. Have you ever played, your, or do you remember playing the game Musical Chairs when you were a kid? You guys remember this game? And uh, the intensity that, that, that came when there was just one chair that was left. And you remember how it happens, don't you? One chair remains, two people are left in the game, the music plays, and you circle the chair, and you really hope that when the music stops playing, that, man, you're found to be in the chair, and you win, right? When it comes to your allegiance to who Jesus Christ is, there's one throne. And it can either be Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, or it can be you fill in the blank with the help of the Holy Spirit. But there can only be one winner. What will it be? And it's an internal consequence. Here's the third type of competing love, the, uh, the consequences of competing love. It's temporal consequences. Jesus himself said nobody can serve two masters he was talking about money, and he was talking about God, but it fits into so many different other categories as well. You can only serve one master. His name is Jesus, and if you want anything other than Jesus first, it's not going to work well for you because you'll end up hating the one and clinging to the other. And then finally, and probably most importantly, there are eternal consequences if you have a divided heart, if you have two loves in your life, there's eternal consequences. This is a verse that will help you lose sleep tonight if you're looking for a way to stay awake. In, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus himself said this, He who is not for me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. That's a verse that will rattle your bones. The Christian life is not just part of a file that belongs in the filing cabinet called Christianity. Your love for Jesus is not just you know, another tab in the, the file drawer of life. The Christ, your love for Jesus Christ is everything. Jesus is the pearl of great price for whom we sacrifice everything else. Competing loves are a common problem what is competing for your affections for Jesus Christ? And finally this morning, competing loves are detected in the gap between saying and doing. Discovering if you have anything that competes for your love of Jesus Christ is found and exists between the gap of what I'm saying I believe and what I'm doing to show what I believe. Returning to our text, here comes the difficult part of the conversation because it doesn't just end with, do you love me more than these? The last half of verse 15, Peter said to Jesus, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, shepherd my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to, it, to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. 
Now, really quickly, I got a little bit of time. We can talk about it here this morning. Have you ever heard uh, a sermon or a lesson spoken or preached about these verses and, and the theories as to why Jesus asks the question three times? And one of the theories that Jesus asks the question three times is because Peter denied Jesus three times. You've heard that? We'll get to that in just a second. Have you also heard that the reason Jesus asked the question three times has to do with the word love? Have you heard this? That within these, these section of verses, there are two Greek words that are used to use, that are translated the same English word for love. The first word that Jesus says is, Peter, do you know that I, do you love me more than these? That's agapao. That is from the, uh, the noun agape, the godly, the all supreme, the unconditional type of love. And then there's another word that is used for love that Peter seems to reply with over and over, and it's the word phileo, which is brotherly love. And so there's been this theory that's out there that Jesus is reaching for the right answer. Peter, do you love me with a godly supreme love? And time after time, Peter's response has always been, well, yeah, you know that I love you like a buddy. And not satisfied with that answer, Jesus asks again, Simon, do you love me? Yeah, you're my friend. And so there's been a lot of emphasis placed on that. Here's what I want to say about the number of times Jesus questioned him and the words that are used here. I think too much is read into that personally. And I've been guilty of reading too much into that in the past. Let me tell you and explain to you why I think that Jesus is just trying Peter to understand the lesson and maybe Peter was a little slow and needed it brought to his attention three times. Okay? Um, these words that are used here, the word love, yes, it is true. Agape is used by Jesus. Phileo is used by um, Simon Peter. But if that was the case, if Jesus was looking for a, a supreme kind of love, did you know that the third time Jesus asks it, Right here, Simon, son of John, do you love me? All of a sudden, Jesus switches his language to, Simon, do you phileo me? And Simon responds, yes, Lord, you know I phileo you. You know you're like a brother to me. So what happened? Did Jesus just lower his expectations and his standards for what he wanted from Simon? Here's what I think is in all of the language that's being used here and why there's different verbiage that's used. I think... It's the fact, uh, three reasons why I think the words aren't necessarily, we, pl we place too much emphasis on the words, okay? First of all, did you know they weren't speaking Greek in the first place? More than likely, they were speaking Aramaic. There's not different words for the word love in Aramaic. As John is choosing to write his gospel in Greek, it was the common language of that day, and so he's writing in Greek. As somebody who's been writing a lot of papers for school, I can tell you that when you're writing a lot of papers, you don't want to use the same word over and over and over and over. And so what you do is you right-click your mouse and you click on the word and it gives you a suggested synonym. And you replace that word with a suggested synonym. I think all John is doing here is he's like, look, I'm going to use a different word here so it doesn't get boring to my readers. Think of it this way. If I was to ask you, hey, do you love me? And you're like, Mark, you know I adore you. Does that change the essence of the conversation? Here's the thing I want you to understand. Given the context of John chapter 21, these verses are not about the quality or the depth of love. It's not about competing. It's about competing loves. It's not about the quality of love. Do you love me like God loves me? Or do you love me like a brother loves me? That's not what Jesus is concerned with. He's like, do you love me more than these? It's about competing loves. And Jesus is trying to tell Peter, Peter, it has to be more than simply singing a song at church on Sunday mornings. It has to be more than just simply handing out bulletins or volunteering in the nursery or preparing communion or serving communion. You have to have actions that are congruent with what it is you say you believe on a Sunday morning. It's got to be more than just nodding your head in agreement with the sermon. It has to show up in your daily actions. Do you love me, Peter? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Then do something about it. And three times Jesus says, feed my sheep, tend my lambs. It all means the same thing. Again, I think just different words used so he's not using the same language over and over again. He's like, then take care of my people. Lead my church, Peter. 
Take the love that you say you have for me and demonstrate it on the way that you love and care for others. What Jesus is again emphasizing to Simon Peter, not once, not twice, but three times, all competing loves need to bow before the throne of Jesus Christ. In other words, if you're going to say you're a Christian, then live like a Christian. That's what Jesus is saying. And that's what I believe Jesus would be saying to your heart and my heart today. If you're going to say you're a Christian, then live like a Christian. We have our own way of saying this. See if you can fill in the blanks. Talk is... Wait, say that again. Talk is... You're with me. Talk is cheap. This is where the rubber meets the road. Put up or... You got it. And Jesus is like, if you say you love me, why are you back here fishing? There's a gap here, Peter, in what you said you believed and the way that you're behaving now. Get busy doing what I've called you to do. And today we're going to close with a very important question for you to consider, and that's this. What area of your life are you putting before Jesus Christ? Today we've simply spent time becoming aware that we might have a competing love for Jesus. We've spent some time just simply evaluating if there's a problem. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to finish out John's Gospel with what to do if there is a problem. If there is a competing love. But what we're going to do right now is I'm going to pray and then we're going to have our time of decision. So will you join me? Will you stand up? We'll pray and then we'll sing a song of decision here this morning.